and thank you everybody for coming. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Good. Well, I'm going to sit down. I've never given the paper with one leg before. We will see how it, how it goes. Um, it's called in the program Experiments and After, I think, and I've called it Northfield Forever, but it's all the same thing. It's about Northfield, isn't it? Um, one, of the, one of the things is when you write a paper, you write it before you get to the, the conference, and when, when you're at the conference and you've heard a bit, you want to write a completely different <laughs> paper. Um, but this is what I wrote before. <laughs> um, uh, we did exchange papers, all the speakers, so we'll, we'll stick to what we decided. So, um, I say, um, we are celebrating this inspiring uh, set of ideas that erupted here in Birmingham in 1942 to 1945. <clears throat> Following Tom's lead, and I think we're all very grateful to Tom for his charting so much of the history of Northfield. Following his lead in his book, um, I became interested in Rickman. There's a bit of a story, I think, to, I don't know what's happened, but when you wrote the book, you were very keen on Rickman. Now you're very keen on Bridger. <laughs> and one, both of them, yes. Uh, and I was influenced by and, and drawn to uh, take an interest in Rickman, who was such a behind-the-scenes kind of person. Um, but actually, I discover he had a great deal of influence, not just on Northfield, but on psychoanalysis and probably psychiatry in general. Um, he did have a, uh, this uh, uh, influence in psychiatry, in the war, and in psychoanalysis uh, in Britain. He had an early interest in anthropology uh, when he was in Russia during the First World War, and this may have led him to take an interest in the ideas of Kurt Lewin. Um, I've got some slides here, if I can work them. Um, there, that's John Rickman. <coughs> um, Pearl King, a British psychoanalyst who was one of Rickman's biographers, wrote, and I'll quote from Pearl King, since 1939, the work of Kurt Lewin had immediately registered with Rickman when he had got to know it through reading J.F. Brown's Psychology and the Social Order. So I ought to, that's the quote I've just quoted. Um, uh, and Brown is a very um, unknown sort of person who I could not find a picture of on the internet, so you've got a picture of his book, Psychology and the Social Order, which I think was very influential in the 1930s. Um, Lewin's ideas had been comprehensively described by Brown um, in that influential book of his, Psychology and the Social Order. Brown had studied with Lewin in Berlin in the 1920s and was, in the 1930s, professor of psychology at Kansas, University of Kansas, and also chief psychologist at the Menninger Clinic. Lewin's ideas were also known to others. Um, here's a picture of Lewin, if you want. Um, for example, Eric Trist, a psychologist initially at the Maudsley, uh, joined the Tavistock group during the war 
for which um, Tom has uh, just been talking about, the Tav that Tavistock group, when they were setting up a new experimental officer selection process in the army. Trist had made the acquaintance of Lewin and Lewin's social field theory prior to the war. Um, also, a man called Ronald Hargreaves, who was senior psychiatrist at the War Office and very supportive of the work that went on in Northfield. He encouraged the Northfield group, including Fuchs, I understand, to read Lewin and social field theory. Now, these experiments I'm suggesting at Northfield were strongly influenced by social field theory that had come into British psychology, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis in the 1930s, uh, particularly through uh, the influence of John Rickman. Tom earlier emphasized this impact of the social dimension on psychiatry and how it reverberated in the Northfield discussions uh, between the uh, standard individualistic approach and these new ideas coming in about the social dimension of psychiatry, of organizations in general. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the experiments, as they're called, at Northfield. Uh, was it one? Was it two? Was it three? I've divided it into three. The idea of experiments is rather different in social science and mental health than in physical science and in healthcare. So what does it mean to talk of the Northfield experiments? There were several experiments at Northfield. Generally, the... Uh, oh, I've got a picture of Fuchs here that, of course, you know <coughs> Fuchs, most of you, all of you. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so, I didn't want to leave him out. Uh, and he comes in again later. The first Northfield experiment was conducted by Rickman, uh, who was the inspiration with the ideas, and Bion, uh, who actually conducted the experiment on the ground in the rehabilitation board. It was regarded as a failure in the sense that it was closed down after six weeks. What would have been a success? Um, today, we would require outcome studies. That is to say, running an experiment gives certain results which show the predicted effects, or not the predicted effects. In a laboratory, the experimental results are usually measured changes in the substances after an intervention. <coughs> in fact, the idea of Northfield as a conventional experiment has been taken up and criticized on that basis. Let me just, a couple of points uh, that I'll come to a little later about the first Northfield experiment. Um, somebody called Edgar Jones, not Max Well Jones, but uh, a much more recent psychologist, wrote about Rickman and Beale's approach, saying, no attempt had been made to evaluate the effectiveness of these groups, and their abbreviated nature made retrospective analysis impossible, he said. And in fact, there are no available statistics of the outcome. Aubrey Lewis, also, who was a director uh, and, uh, of the Maudsley Hospital in the 1940s, criticized these innovations, uh, or rather criticized the innovations at Mill Hill. Um, Mill Hill, I'm sure 
you know, was where Maxwell Jones conducted his parallel comparable attempts to think about group processes in psychiatry. Uh, Aubrey Lewis criticised the innovations at Mill Hill, designated, designating them as research projects and that they lacked necessary rigour. Another Morsley psychiatrist, Elliot S uh, Slater, who was later editor of the prestigious British Journal of Psychiatry, said, my report, a report on these experiments in Northfield, criticises the results as being over-optimistic, um, which was quoted in uh, Tom's book. <clears throat> well, I wanted in this paper to speculate a bit on whether that is a fully appropriate way of considering ideas and experiments in mental health. Then there was the second Northfield experiment, what I'm calling the second Northfield experiment, took the key ideas based on Kurt Lewin, um, uh, social field theory from Bion and Rickman and applied them in a different way. This was uh, initiated uh, by Bridger and it seems significantly supported a little later by Tom Main in his, uh, as I call it, dazzling but acidic prose. Anyone wants a good read, you must go and read Tom Main. He uh, sets your hair on in. <laughs> and then, the, just to complete it, uh, the second, the third, uh, sorry, that's the second Northfield experiment, the taking over of Lewin's ideas, and the third Northfield experiment, where we come back to Fuchs, is relevant especially to this workshop, I suppose, Fuchs's parallel development conceives the social field a little differently from that derived from Kurt Lewin. Um, his interest has always seemed to me to be how the individuals create a social matrix, each individual being a nodal point in that network. Fuchs taking his ideas from Goldstein and from Norbert Elias. His approach, therefore, uh, because Goldstone was also uh, getting his ideas from a similar source to Kurt Lewin, that is German Gestalt psychology, which looked at the way we humans perceive an entire field of our perception and pick out a figure from that ground. Um, I'd rather take it for granted that you, you will be familiar with Gestalt psychology and how it was adapted to social fields. But anyway, that's a little explanation for those who aren't so familiar. Both Fuchs and uh, Lewin and Rickman derived their ideas of the individual in society from this conception of gestalt psychology. Uh, and I'm saying that Fuchs's interest has always seemed to me to be how the individuals create this social matrix, each individual being a nodal point in a network. And he did this under the influence of Goldstein and um, uh, Norbert Elias. So Fuchs's approach was parallel to Rickman's, which was uh, derived from Lewin, it, uh, where <coughs> each individual is in relation to the group as a whole. Fuchs seemed to see each individual in relation to each other individual to become the group as a whole. Um, I've already been told off that this is not quite an accurate difference, but um, <laughs> Dieter can uh, quarrel when we have a moment at the end. <laughs> I don't think these two perspectives negate each other, and therefore I've called them parallel. 
Now let me dwell <coughs> for a moment on this. Bjorn and Rickman approached the rehabilitation unit as a low morale group. Combat soldiers, they said, no longer in combat, were moodily reclining as failures in hospital, leaving their comrades back at the front in the thick of the fighting and the danger. The individuals were required by their commanding officer, that was Bion, to in the rehabilitation ward, to connect with that problem of the morale and to develop meaningful responses to that kind of culture of the field within the rehabilitation unit. In practice, they developed various activities, all, all sorts of kinds. Uh, these were necessary to create individuals within a context, a social field of more lively and high morale activity. Now, Fuchs's experiment, um, this third one, third Northfield experiment as I'm calling it, and I'll quote a bit from Tom's book. Uh, in the hospital, every activity remained compartmentalized. The training wing stayed separate from the medical unit. The physical examinations were carried out independently of the psychiatric interviews and so on. Now, later, uh, <coughs> Um, in, in his book, uh, Tom described the attempts to deal with this. And uh, this is the way he describes it. One solution to this was to encourage Fuchs to use his talents on a roving commission around the hospital. And in the autumn of 1945, this is precisely what Tom Main, who was the clinical head in the hospital at the time, that's what Maine encouraged. This led to Fuchs acting as troubleshooter and peripatetic therapist. Fuchs saw this as a way of fostering links between different sections of the hospital and bringing the hospital to life again. <coughs> now turning to Fuchs, um, I want to give a couple of uh, quotes from him. He said of his role, making connections like this, that when he linked the treatment services on one hand with the occupational therapy on the other, that linking exerted by itself a dynamic influence on the rest of the hospital. And he took that as his aim in therapeutic groups to create a culture of active participation on the part of the group members, which is the conductor's first aim. Uh, the, the idea, I believe, of the matrix. Now, I assume Fuchs's interest in linking between hospital departments is exactly comparable to the links between individuals in the therapeutic group. So the difference I'm drawing attention to is, on one hand, the relations of one separate individual to the whole, and on the other, the various individual points that interconnect to make up the whole. Um, in the former, it leads to an investigation of the individual to the whole relationship as the tasks are performed, and in the latter, it leads to joining up the dots, that is the individuals, as it were, as the task which is to be performed. Okay, uh, having tried to convey something of this spectrum of experiments, um, I want now to go back to my point about experiments in the human sciences. Have I only got five minutes left? Oh dear. <clears throat> These social and psychological experiments start with ideas that are completely different from those of physical 
science. They involve beliefs and moral judgments. If you approach a job such as running a military hospital with ideas and ethical human relations, then you are going to have a difficulty in sorting out what happens in the experiment from one's own beliefs and judgment. It's no good looking to blind or double-blind designs. You can't really camouflage or blind yourself to a psychological intervention. But it's not just that there are psychogenic and sociogenic factors in the research team. The problem is that beliefs and moral judgments are the very nature of social science itself. With our contemporary view of science, we prioritise outcomes, the results of the interventions. What then can be the outcome if we, the researchers, are intimately involved inside the experimental setup? Inevitably, we, as much as the patients, must be part of the outcome. So when beliefs, personal subjective judgments and ethical relations are concerned, it may be we should look at different directions for outcomes. <coughs> so one can say the outcome of the first experiment was not numbers of soldiers returning to their fighting units and no longer breaking down, that was not a measured outcome that was known. But there were other outcomes. In, it was the second Northfield experiment, which was the outcome of the first. Um, a passionate commitment to Lewin's ideas. Uh, Lou infiltration, as it is called by Bridger. So when I said that the outcome of an interrelationship between research and the research was the hallmark of social and psychological science, we see here two important outcomes. The development of a psychoanalytic movement from Northfield uh, uh, and the development uh, and sorry, and the second thing that I'm saying were a lot of rivalries between the inventors uh, and the innovators of the claims to the provenance of the outcome. Tom talked about the violent rows that went on all the time. Um, now, I don't mean this trivially. There are genuine outcomes of innovations in the social domain. And in fact, uh, I did a little list here um, of the many outcomes of Northfield. Uh, Tom also went through a number of them. My list says, first, the therapeutic community, then the group therapies, uh, then immediately after the war, the civil resettlement units, then the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, the Group Relations Training Program, like the Leicester Conference, and anti-psychiatry in the 1960s revolutionary view with, I've put here, its dialectical antithesis, Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> These are not experimental outcomes as we would describe them in science. They are, however, outcomes of the Northfield experiments. They are the developments of social processes in the manner of Norbert Elias's historical journey, what he called the sociogenic and psychogenic intermingling in the civilizing process. <coughs> they are not experimental outcomes in the ordinary sense because we apply our judgments, good or bad, rigorous or not, ethical, democratic, etc., etc., we become involved and our belief systems change for or against. <coughs> I have... Uh, we'll have to try and... Uh, yes, I want to... So... I want to make... Um, a last comment, what would be my last comment? <laughs> I wanted to make a comment about democracy that came up earlier, uh, saying that I no longer have a simple belief in the idea of democracy, the corruption inherent 
in the inequalities of wealth, the underlying and secret manipulation of opinion through distorting advertising techniques, fake news have in the last years demonstrated the fragility and imperfection of democracy. I wanted to remind you that Churchill didn't like democracy, but he thought it was the best of systems. This means it's not perfect. And what do we do? How do I, we identify the imperfections? That's rushing through my conclusions. The Northfield experiment were one growth point in Western culture with an enduring outcome, I'm saying. It has contributed to seven decades of beliefs and ethical judgments about human beings and how we connect with our societies and how we consider the malfunction of both individuals and societies. Uh, the end point of that discussion has now been, in my view, a souring of our set of beliefs in the democratic underpinnings of those experiments. Thank you particularly for being so flexible to the context that you fitted it in. It's on the table, Marina. So we have another 15 minutes for questions following this very interesting review of the experiment. David in the front. Could the blinds be pulled across? Yeah. I wonder if somebody next to that um, Harpreet, perhaps you could be the person. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, thank, thank you. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, very um, thoughtful, uh, detailed kind of review. I, well, I, want to, I want to pick you up on one point because I, I think you're, you're being a bit ideologically perhaps opposed to. Um, kind, of, kind of more traditional health outcomes. And I, I think that beyond the first experiment, from what I read, um, even in the six weeks that it took place, the men who he was working with did do more things. They became more active. Um, and I think, in, I used to work in the forensic field, and in the forensic field it's quite well known that you had what they call proxy outcomes, because you can't, for example, if you're working with people in a secure unit, you can't tell if the results are going to result, uh, if the outcome 10 years down the line is going to be a reformed person. So you have outcomes which you think stand in for longer term outcomes. And I, and I think if some, I, I agree that it wasn't actually written up that way, but I, I think Beyond's account does suggest that there were fairly straightforward clinical type outcomes which could have stood in for longer term improvement. It didn't happen. In other words, it, I think that was there too. It wasn't. Uh, of course, the out, the main outcomes were organisational and cultural, but I think there were clinical outcomes too. Um, yes, um, I don't know if it's a clinical outcome. It was a social outcome, yeah. wasn't it? That the culture of the rehab unit, according to Beyond, as you say, a few of his remarks um, were that the culture of the unit changed. Um, whether that's um, a psychiatric clinical outcome, whether it's the military outcome of getting soldiers back to the war, we don't know. Um, I don't know much about proxy outcomes in, forensic, in a forensic unit, but you do have follow-up studies mm -hmm. from forensic units, and I think that's what these people were talking about, Elliot Slater, Edgar Jones. How many of those people went back to fight in, in fighting units, which might have been the military outcome? Fighting units wasn't the task. It was getting them operating in the army. I, it, it's what Edgar Jones and Elliot Slater are talking about, no? It was to be, get people functioning in the army, maybe as medical orderly. Oh, yes, sure, sure, sure. Fighting. That, that, that might be. Yeah, functioning people, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but do we know how many? No. no. Uh, thank you, Tom. I, I think I want to uh, stretch the outcomes discussion, as we're beginning to do, um, because I wrote down serendipity and spin-off. And, of course, 
any change that anybody does. You actually can't know what the spin-offs and the outcomes, not measured outcomes, but outcomes are. So I'm fascinated with the time and the place of the experiments and how the outcomes or the experience or the changes slip into a social system of that time to allow all those other things right through to antipsychosis. <coughs> so I'm stretching outcomes to uh, spin-offs and see what, where that takes us. Yes. Thank you. Well, really, that was what I was trying to do, the, the, yes, the spin-off exactly. being the impact on psychiatry over seven decades, I, I say. Well, a lot of it has um, faded, but uh, here we are representing one of the spin-offs, as you would call it, of Northfield. And this is an, an important outcome. Picking up on the spin-off, I have a question to both of you, because the War Officer Selection Boards, they are not included in the list of what happened at Northfield. But my question is, could one say that the War Officer Selection Boards encapsulated, already encapsulated, uh, main components of the work in Northfield? Hmm. Yes, they were conducted six months before the experiment, first experiment in Northfield. The first six months of 1942, Northfield was January 1943. Yes, they were, uh, and that's where Rickman's ideas were first used by Bion, Trist, Bridger, I think, was he in the first... Um, no, he was in the first tranche. No, he was up in Northfield. Uh, but several of them set up this uh, officer selection system in Edinburgh. Uh, and then um, when Northfield was opened as a military hospital at the end of 1942, they moved to Beyond and uh, Rickman came first Tristan. in 1943. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I've got the dates wrong, but Rickman was there first. He was there Six months before being on Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Rickman was a Quaker, you know, and, and didn't sign up for military service until 1942 when Bion persuaded him, you are needed in military psychiatry, join the army. And as a Quaker, he did uh, agree to join the army, uh, at least the army psychiatric service. Um, just a follow-up question on the um, selection boards, actually, because I was interested in that in the first talk as well. Um, I wonder if there's any outcome data on the effectiveness of, of those, because um, what I'm thinking of is the work that was done in Israel a couple of decades later, where Kahneman um, revised the process from what was thought to be um, a psych psychologically-based system to a system that was actually completely... Um, what's the word, not mechanised, but it was uh, completely mechanical. Mm. And that was found to be more effective uh, mm. than the panels making judgments. So I'm interested <laughs> in whether um, there was any data about how effective the, the psychiatric approach to officer selection was. Um, well, my understanding, maybe you know more about it, Tom, but my understanding it was, uh, as it was an effective outcome but not in those sort of measured terms. These officer selection boards were set up because after Dunkirk in 1940, the British Army reformed and the people in charge of the army said, my God, where are we going to get all these public school educated officers from to create this new army? And the answer was, we can't. And so that the selection boards were set up in order to recruit from the ordinary ranks of the army, which they did. And that was the outcome, as I understand. Well, the outcome is also... The selection boards were exactly from the public schools. Sorry? The people who were in charge of the selection boards were from the public schools. No, they weren't. Yes, yes. Well... Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that's true. Well, um, Rickman and Bion Psychologists wouldn't have been. Hmm? Oh, Bion was, but yes. But Rickman I mean, was, there other people in, in charge of, uh, other people involved. Uh. Um, 
I'm just thinking of two other notable writers who worked on quite a bit more neuroses, which is to say Freud and Fairbairn. And both of them basically find an idea of the demonic in, in their work. That's the, 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 the idea that organizes their work kind of thing. And I'm just thinking that in a way, both Main and Bion also find that idea, although they give it a kind of pseudoscientific um, uh, vocabulary. Sorry, what, what was the idea you were referring to? The demonic. Oh. I mean, both... Uh, Freud, Freud gets the death drive. One of the one of the one of the way stations to the death drive is the war neuroses. Fairbairn is, is constantly talking about devils and and so forth in his work on the war neuroses in the forties. But I'm just thinking that I mean this discussion has been very social scientific. But in a sense, one thinks of Main talking about you know that wonderful denouement in as you say that superbly written essay, The Ailment, is about the discovery of the parasite. You know, and and um, and likewise, you know, what's so amazing about Bion's book is this sense that people can become possessed in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it's, um, just very briefly, yes, it, it goes back to my point, you can't leave value judgments and ethics out of it, and uh, it, to some extent, um, Freud demonized the unconscious, didn't he? Is that uh, thing, the working away, it spoiled everything. And that, yes, taken up by... Um, <laughs> psychoanalysts in, um, in, in these wartime uh, ex experiments. Uh, it's stretching the argument, but yes, I think um, there was good and bad about the social system that these uh, people were working in, and they had arguments about what was good and what was bad. One, more, one last question. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, this is a bit like a film. I'm thinking about a prequel. Um, that one of the things that Bion thought up uh, was the democratization of um, getting the soldiers in the platoons to recommend from their own ranks people who they thought would make good officers. Mm -hmm. And while uh, the, the same rate of about 50% uh, of people actually going on to officer training was made, um, the, the actual <coughs> Applications went up by about a thousand percent, but I don't know what ever happened to that. Did it? Did, does it still go on in the British Army, the British forces? I mean, it was a superb idea. It, yes, and Bion was very impressed with his own idea, and in his, <laughs> and in his letters, he discusses with Rickman whether the whole of society could be organized and we can, um, we can elect our MPs by throwing up from our local communities uh, people who are nominated. Any. Yes, I don't know if that happens in the military now at all. It was stopped, it was stopped by, by the British Army. It stopped by the war office. So, yes. I'm afraid we're going to have to bring it to a close for now and follow this up in our small groups. Thank you so much.